I'm Keith McCarkin from Integral Asset Management, and uh, let's let's jump in. The objective of this series is how is is to teach one how to understand a business, consider its listed shares as an investment, and construct a portfolio of those shares. It's really broken up into three three simple and obvious sections. First of all, uh, looking at the fundamentals of a business, answering the question, is it good? Is, a, is the business, is the company good or bad? Which is a very simple question to ask, a very complicated one to answer. Once we've found the business that is good, how much should we pay for its shares? How much should we pay for that business or company? That's valuation. That's what we're going to be focusing on this evening. And the final one that's still coming up is once we found companies we like and we're comfortable with evaluations, how should we think about holding multiple of them, i.e. constructing a portfolio? Um, we will then have a follow-up case study on packing some of this with Q&A that Simon touched on. But uh, it's important to note that this series is an introduction. It's, it's not focusing on the mathematics, the formulas or financial jargon. We're trying to keep this simple and intuitive. I will have gray boxes and touch on and highlight either, either these, the mathematics formulas or financial jargon or even economic concepts and various things that you can then go and Google and research on your own time. There is a wealth of knowledge out there and there is the internet, the collective knowledge of humankind at your fingertips, make use of it. But I will not be unpacking that in this uh, in, in this series. So we're just highlighting it, not not uh, necessarily uh, talking about it or delving into it. Uh, in terms of what we're talking about today, in part two valuations, I'm just going to remind you what the fundamentals were. Then unpack two types of two big baskets of styles of valuations one can use, which is re relative and absolute valuations, unpack relatives, including examples, and then unpack absolutes uh, and absolute valuation metrics. Uh, touch on some things to consider, and then hopefully we'll have a time for a summary and or time for questions. Uh, just a reminder on the fundamentals is when looking at businesses and looking at companies, uh, what you want to find is ones that are operating in industries with high barriers to entry that create few competitors. Within that industry, though, the individual business has strong competitive advantages, which is how it competes with its competitors. And even better, if whatever product or service it's offering um, there are no substitutes for that product or service. Uh, the combination of that and a number of other things can lead to really strong and resilient pricing power. It's the ability for the company to price that product or service and its customers to just have to accept that uh, price or service um, at that price. And, uh, and uh, these strong fundamentals, we, we preferably want to find in a large total addressable market company can't really grow larger than its market. Um, and therefore, the larger the market it operates in, the larger this company can grow to, especially if the fundamentals are good and, uh, and in its favor and there's tailwinds in the industry. Larger the business is, uh, the larger its ultimate investment returns can potentially be for us as shareholders going along on the ride. Uh, now, with all these fundamentals, we want to make sure the individual business is well managed. So therefore, we look at and we ensure that even though it ticks all these above, uh, above boxes, that the individual business has strong cash generation and is an appropriate cost structure and appropriate debt or none when in doubt. There are a range of other major risks I touch on and all things worth considering. So th this is the fundamentals, and they allow us to say whether this company is good or bad. But we're not buying something because it's good or bad. Um, and uh, let me rephrase that. Once we found something that is good, it do doesn't necessarily make a good investment unless we ensure that we pay an appropriate price for it. So the next logical question after finding a good company is how much is its stock worth? And uh, there is a difference between the share price and the fair value of the company. Warren Buffett says is very nice. I'm going to quote Warren Buffett a couple of times through this presentation. He says, price is what you pay 
but value is what you get. And in the, in, in, in the stock market, price is the share price, but value is really the fair value or intrinsic value of the underlying company or business that you get. Those are two different things. And we want to preferably find the best company with the, with the highest value trading at the lowest price. Um, so jumping into valuations, there are two major buckets of valuations. There's relative valuations versus absolute valuations. And relative valuations are really comparing apples with apples. It's saying that this stock is cheap relative to another stock or groups of stocks. If I am looking, if I'm holding an apple in my hand and I'm considering buying this apple, how expensive is this apple? Is it cheap or is it expensive? Well, the logical thing to do is to compare it versus all the other apples out there. So find, put together a bag of apples at a market and consider what the average price of those apples are. And then I can compare it versus the price of this apple. Um, an example, not using fruit, is because bank A, B, and C are trading at whatever valuation, whatever metric you choose, the fact that bank D is trading at a valuation below those banks implies that it could be cheap. Now, the strengths of the relative valuation is that it's easy, convenient, quick, and intuitive. You can do this on a matchbox. Uh, it's easy to understand comparing apples with apples. Um, bang, good, good to go. But the weaknesses are that you might not be comparing apples with apples. Sometimes there are oranges in the mix. So, you, so a relative valuation is only as good as the comparatives. And there's an implicit assumption that the bag of apples we've taken from the market are in fact correctly valued in the first place. What if those apples are cheap or expensive? We're comparing our apple our individual Apple too. What if, what if it isn't that bank D is cheap? It is in fact that bank A, B, and C are expensive. So there are subtleties and shortcomings in this, in this manner. Then we get absolute valuations. And absolute valuations is really looking into a crystal ball. What you are doing is forecasting the future and present valuing that future and saying that this company or the stock is cheap relative to its future. In other words, the stock is cheap relative to the expected dividends or cash flows. The obvious examples are discounted free cash flow, dividend discount or Gordon growth model. Now, the strength of this, these absolute valuations is they can capture asset specific variables and risks. If, for example, this apple that we are holding in our hand is, is really unique and there isn't really another apple out there in this world that we can compare it to, it's some special breed of apple and there's only one of them, we can, relatives won't be very useful, absolute smart, because we can capture that asset specific variable. The problem with absolutes is they're complex and slow. There are numerous assumptions to involve. And last but not least, don't forget what you are doing here is valuing the future and no one knows what the future is. And therefore, your assumptions could be wrong. So relatives versus absolutes. So jumping into relatives, the next obvious question is if we are valuing this apple versus a bag of apples. Um, well, what? bag of apples do we choose relative to what and relative to where and this may be an obvious thing to state but but let me state it anyway different businesses in different places are different um, good quality comparatives uh, good comparatives uh, need good quality comparisons so when deciding which which apples to put in that bag or which companies to compare versus the one that you're trying to do, look for specifically the same business models so that you're comparing apples with apples. Also consider um, that you want to compare it versus larger companies and not the other way around. What I mean is one should build, one assumes that the larger the company is, the more efficiently priced its stock is. So therefore, we can use that as an efficient pricing mechanism to 
to compare to a small cap or a smaller company, but we don't want to do it the other way around. I'm not going to go and value a large business based on the price of a small business. So larger, the larger, the better for comparatives. Consider revenue in the same places and assets in the same places because countries are different and have different risks. Costs should be similar, debt and gearing should be the same, cost structures, look for the same sectors, same business models, all of these things are ensuring we are comparing apples with apples. When in doubt, more comparatives are better than less, as one hopes that the differences, and there are always subtle differences, there are almost never, never say never, but there are never businesses that are the same in the world. All, of, all businesses are actually unique creatures. Um, some are closer to others, uh, to some than others, but but what we hope is that um, by using large sample sizes, we can average out the differences. So when in doubt, more comparators are better than less, as one hopes the differences average them, themselves out over large sample sizes. An example is in the, domestic, in, in the South African space, Vodacom and MTN, they're both mobile operators. Bang, we've got two stocks, we can compare them. The problem is which one's the relative because you have a sample of one relative to a sample of one. So maybe we look a little further afield, we look at Telcom, uh, but Telcom's here. Telcom has a mobile side, but it, but it has a large fiber side and it has, has a legacy um, landline side. So is that really a good comparison? Are they comparable? We could look a little bit further into Blue Label, but Blue Label doesn't have a, a Tolco's uh, license other than an indirect written off stake into Sol C. Its core business is, is uh, distribution. So this is a totally different business model, even though it's listed in the same sector. So we could look at AT&T and Vodafone, but once again, revenue and assets are not in the same place. Those are offshore. So consider these things in looking at comparatives. Likewise, EBSA, Nedbank, First Rand, Standard Bank may be good comparatives if we ignore the fact that Standard Bank is larger into Africa, First Rand has a large UK operation, and so on and so on. Maybe they're good comparatives, but are they good comparatives versus Capitech? Capitech is a totally different cost structure. So do we look further afield into Goldman Sachs and HSBC? Ah, the problem is those are offshore. That's uh, American and UK banks, assets and revenues in different places. So these are the things when considering relatives and you're building your, your collection of your bag of apples that you're going to use to value the, the apple in your hand. Consider that different businesses in different places are different. So we want to select uh, uh, and, and make sure they're as close as possible. Further reading, you can have a look at industry classifications, consider the eff efficient market hypothesis, consider things like sovereign risk, which dictate different, different valuations and different geographies. So say we've selected, we've dug through uh, the market and we have found, um, if uh, I'm gonna carry on running with that Apple's example, um, the apple in our hand is a golden delicious. As we've dug through the market, we've ignored all the Granny Smith and all the Fuji apples and all the other crazy wild apples out there. And we've hand selected all the, all the other golden delicious apples out there. And we've now got a bag of golden delicious apples. We got great. We've got good quality comparatives. Now, how do we compare them? So each market valuation metric measures a different thing. The overarching golden rule here is whatever metric drives the business should probably drive the valuation as well. And therefore, that's probably the metric one, one wants to choose. Consider which metrics are important for you as well. If you're buying something for dividend, dividends and dividend yields, maybe the yield is more relevant, things like that. But, um, but this is really a, a, a great starting point is to consider once, you, once you've got good comparatives, consider what drives the underlying business model, build, put, build, take out those relatives, and uh, then you can compare it. So, but when in doubt, Relatives based on earnings, cash flows, dividends, and net asset values can be considered the end point of capturing a business model. Those are always good. I will, own, I will have a list of summary of ones in the next slide, but let's jump across to uh, Vodacom and MTN. 
and we are going to use them as relatives and compare them to each other. Now, what drives telcos? Um, and by the way, we ignored all the other telcos. They're not great comparisons versus these two. So what drives uh, telcos? Well, it's quite simple. Um, you've got subscribers that drive earnings and cash flows and ultimately get paid out in dividends. That's really what drives a mature telcos. Everything else is noise in building up to those things. You need to build the network and maintain the network and have your, uh, your license and spectrum and blah, 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 all of that to attract subscribers. And subscribers drive earnings and cash flows, which allow you to pay dividends. Everything else is broadly noise here. So what are good relatives based on these drivers? Well, we can take their market caps and divide them by the subscribers. We can take the subscribers, well, revenue and divide it by the subscribers, which is something, which is an industry metric called average revenue per user, ARPU. Or we can just take price earnings, free cash flow yield, dividend yields, all once again, tracking earnings, cash flows, and dividends. These are good comparisons. We've got our bag of apples and we're pulling out those metrics and we're going, okay, now how, how, does, how do these average metrics compare to the apple in our hands? Um, there are a range of other things to read on this, particularly in terms of understanding what drives a business model. The next slide has a list of relatives, but look at first principles, value investing topics, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway letters unpack a lot of these things. And, and they touch on a lot of the fundamentals from the previous session, so always worth reading. One Up on Wall Street, Peter Lynch touches on some of these things. Effective investor as well, um, all good background things to, to read. But in terms of relatives, here are some good collections of them. I will not unpack these individually, like I said, these are all well-known relatives and easy to Google. You can search them on your own, but I put them in collections. Remember I said, um, when in doubt, earnings, cash flows, and dividends, net asset value can be, can be used as relatives. There's earnings measures from price earnings to EV EBITDAs. There's cash flow measures from price to cash flow to free cash flow yields. Dividend yield is the obvious one with dividend metrics. Uh, price to book, price to tangible book is good with net asset value. Replacement costs is an intriguing one that's worth Googling as well. Um, and then because different things drive different models, you'll see that I included market cap to subscriber and average revenue per user here, which are not common metrics, but they, they industry specific metrics because they drive underlying business models. So consider the industry you're looking at. In asset management, one can build a market cap to assets under management. In commodities, you can say market cap to resources because you know, in numerous industries, you can do a market cap to accounts for users, subscribers, students, if it's a school or university or tertiary. Insurance has a concept called embedded value. That's really a glorified net asset value or price to book, but they've gone and valued themselves effectively. Private equity and investment holding companies have uh, often published intrinsic NAV, um, consider their share prices uh, as a percentage of that. Retailers publish things like trading density, like for like comparable store sales, hotels, market cap to rooms, average revenue per room, construction market cap to order book. This is far from a comprehensive list. In fact, all of this is far from comprehensive, but it should be enough that it gives you to some working tools to go and Google and think about it on your own and research how these metrics work and, and find the ones that make sense for you, make sense for you, and make sense for the business you're looking at. So what do we want to find when looking at relative valuations? Well, first of all, we want to make sure that we have a good set of comparative businesses comparing apples with apples. And from that good set of comparative businesses, we want to extract logical metrics that are relevant for the valuation and the industry and the business and ensure that our stock that we are looking at is attractively priced relative to those metrics. Our apple in our hand, we can buy cheaper than the average apple in the bag that we are looking at. So before I move to absolute valuations, one has got to understand the concept of the time value of money. The time value of money means quite simply that money now is worth more than money later. This is quite simply because we, in my opinion, the reason this exists 
is because all of us, well, first of all, the future is uncertain, and perhaps more pertinently in the long term, we are mortal. So we are not guaranteed eternity to collect on things. Um, and therefore, we prefer certainty of now over uncertainty of later. Um, now, this may sound funny, the time value of money, but if I asked you, if I gave you two options, I'll give you a thousand rand now, or I'll give you a thousand rand in 50 years time, everybody who is logical will choose a thousand rand now. And in fact, what is a thousand rand in 50 years time worth? Well, we have a useful tool that allows us to move money through time. It's called interest rates. So if I take a thousand rand in 50 years time at a 9% interest, and our present value it um, over 50 years, that thousand rand in 50 years time is only worth 13 rand 45 today. That's nothing. That's why a thousand rand now is worth a lot more than a thousand rand later. In theory, you could take the 13 rand 45, invest it at 9% nine, 9 per annum and arrive at a thousand rand on your own in 50 years time. Now, if I lower the interest rate to four rand, uh, four, uh, four and four and a half percent that thousand rand in 50 years time jumps to 110 rand 71 i.e i've halved the interest rate but in fact i've doubled the present value of that future money 10 times over this is an interesting concept we'll come back to it do not worry about anything else here this is a little bit of an esoteric section but all you need to understand is that there is a time value to money and that we use interest rates to present value future money. In fact, that future money, we discount to the present value. Um, so when I talk about interest rates or discount rates or discounting, that all, that's all the same thing. I'm taking future, some future money and I'm making it, working out what it's, what it's worth today. So understanding the concept of time value of money absolute valuations, there's really two major ones, cash flows and dividends. And the cash flow valuation is called, the, the common term is the discounted free cash flow model, the DCF model. What are we doing? Well, first of all, I want to explain what free cash flow is. I have explained in the fundamentals, the first, uh, first part, I will reiterate the definition, but free cash flow is the cash generated by a business's operations after paying tax, funding working capital or the growth in working capital, and maintaining and reinvesting in its operations, broadly termed capital expenditure, it's the short term for capital expenditure is CapEx. So what do we do with a, with a, a discounted free cash flow model? Well, simple. We forecast cash flow from operations, we take out tax, we take out what we expect them to have to uh, in, uh, um, invest in working capital to maintain, and we take out the expected uh, capex expenditure. And we get effectively a forecast of free cash flows into the future. That forecast of free cash flows, we then pick an interest rate, and there are a lot of things one needs to consider in calculating this interest rate. I uh, will not touch on it, but this interest rate should reflect the risk of the company and the risk of the economy or the economies it's operating in. And we present value those future cash flows. We take all of those things and we present value them to our, our current day term. Uh, and that's effectively our fair value of those, those future free cash flows, which says this is what, the, what we expect the future of this company to be worth. The next step is we then compare what that, what the, what our expected discounted or present value of the future future of that company is versus the share price, and is it higher or lower? It's that simple. Now the pros of this is it captures asset specific flows. Like I said, these cash flows and this growth rate that they grow by, and all the things that are happening in this company might, are, can be uniquely tailored to this company. The, the problem with this is it's only as good as our forecast of the future. And whatever the future is, I can guarantee you it won't be what we expect it to be. So 
a good free cash flow gives you a guard for the future. It is far, far from um, far from fact. It is much closer to to an indicator of what things could be. Um, briefly, I will touch on what this terminal year is. This terminal year is we, typically we for a company is assumed to be sustainable and therefore doesn't just suddenly stop existing after operating for 10 years. A man might, so you may not have a terminal year where you have a finite asset, but a, a company with a sustainable underlying operation, we will typically forecast a number of years, maybe it's uh, 10 years or five years or 20 years, and then we pick a terminal year and we effectively the terminal year in the perfect world should be the year the company becomes mature. And in the terminal year, we create, we assume that the terminal year just compounds for eternity as, as an academic simplification. This little bottom line is called the perpetuity and we present value of that perpetuity as part of these cash flows. That's, that's just a little complexity. But so long as you understand the big picture here, is we are saying that the fair value of this company is the present value of its expected future free cash flows. The dividends, uh, the absolute valuation of a company's dividends is just taking this one step further. And it's broadly called the dividend discount model, the Gordon growth model. But these free cash flows are wonderful. But our own shares in... Um, in Facebook, and that's that's really great that I own shares in Facebook, but it doesn't give me a right to the underlying access. Oh, it doesn't give me a access to the underlying cash flows of Facebook. I can't call up Mark Zuckerberg and I say, "Buddy, really like those cash flows you you've generated. Uh, can you send them? Send me my proportional amount to my bank account." That doesn't you don't have claim to that. But what companies do do is typically a portion of profits a company makes, their board can, emphasis on can, declare as payment to its shareholders. And this is typically called a dividend. So from these cash flows, and ultimately after everything else, we have profits, a proportion of profits can be paid out as dividends. We sometimes take out cash. And in fact, if we are forecasting cash flows, we are indirectly forecasting profits, we can then plug in our forecast for the proportion of profits you expect them to pay out, take out taxes, and present value those profits. The reason this is nice is because as a minority shareholder in, for example, Facebook or Anglo or, or any, any listed company as a, a small little shareholder, I don't have a claim on the cash flows. But but that dividend that they pay truly and realistically and absolutely turns up in my bank account. So this is present valuing what I expect those dividend cash flows to be. Once again, with a terminal year, assuming it's a sustainable business, and not a finite resource. Now, just a, just a final note. Note as companies go, um, as companies get larger, and their growth slows down, they tend to invest less into their own operations and tend to pay out more of their profits as cash flows, or more uh, as dividends at least, sorry. So what tends to happen is your payout ratio tends to rise as you approach that terminal year. Now, I've to told you the pros is dividends are real cash flows as, as a minority shareholder in your bank account. What are the cons? Why don't, why don't more people use this model and why do more people use the discounted uh, free cash flow model? Well, companies, some companies don't pay dividends. So how, how does one go and forecast this? Well, you can, uh, you can guess that in five or 10 years time, they start paying dividends, but that's just one more assumption you're making. The more assumptions you make, the greater the, the, the chance that you have an inaccuracy and your assumptions are wrong. Also, Notice I said the board can declare payments to shareholders as dividends, i.e. the directors can change their minds. The dividend policy can change. As we discovered last year in what is supposed to be a sector that literally has an overarching policy for dividends being paid out, and that's just the, the REIT sector, the listed property sector in South Africa, real estate investment trusts, that, that where 
Redefine turned around and said, you know what, we're not certain how the world is going to play out under COVID. We're not going to pay a dividend because we're just not comfortable to, basically. Um, so even where dividend policies are set in stone, they're not actually set in stone. And then the final thing to consider is like, how do you deal with future communicated share buybacks or uncommunicated share buybacks? Because executives start to view share buybacks as returning capital to shareholders. So they, as they're doing more buybacks, they could do less dividend. It's, so this model is great because it is based on real world cash flows for a minority shareholder, but includes a lot of complexities that also detract from it. So the final concept before we jump, like, uh, kind of move into summary and, and move on from there um, is to understand that absolute valuations are in fact relative. Remember in my time value of money model where I changed this 4% interest rate and by changing this 4% interest rate, well, the 9% interest rate, sorry, 2 or 4%, I, I made, the, made the present value of that, fifth, uh, of that 1,000 Rand 10 times higher. So I halved the interest rate, but my fair value went up 10 times. Therefore, in the dividend model, in the free cash flow model, in absolute valuations where you're present valuing the future, Interest rates are a key variable. And if you change the interest rate, even if your expectations for dividends and cash flows are exactly the same, your fair value will change and sometimes by quite a large amount. And therefore, absolute valuations are in fact relative to interest rates in the economy. The reality is everything is relative. Uh, which is such a cliche, but it is also absolutely true. Um, just as a side note, assuming expectations uh, and putting that in the bag, ignoring it, this is often why markets rally when interest rates are cut and drop when interest rates are, are, are raised, because cutting interest rates, if everything else stays the same, boosts valuations up, and dropping interest rates drops valuations down. That's simple. Uh, so in terms of absolute valuations, what do we want to find? Well, simply, you want to find a company whose stock is cheap against the present value of its expected free cash flows and or its expected future dividends. Um, you want to find a company that is cheap relative to its future. So last thing to touch on before we wrap it all up and move to questions, and hopefully we have time, is that you will, as you get into this world, you'll start to encounter people talking about different styles of investing. Now, any, any investment and any good quality investor, an educated and thoughtful investor will consider everything. No decision is made in the vacuum. And therefore, everyone, all investors should look at fundamentals and valuation. What is interesting is different styles emphasize different things in this process. For example, quality investing will emphasize the fundamentals over the valuation. They will emphasize whether it's a good company and if it's good enough, they might be willing to pay what doesn't look like an attractive valuation. Um, Warren Buffett said it, it, is, it is far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price then a fair company at a wonderful price. This is the emphasis of fundamentals of evaluation, otherwise known as quality investing. Value investing is the polar opposite of that. Really, the emphasis is given here to the valuation of the fundamentals. A value investor will sacrifice quality of fundamentals if the, if the valuation is cheap enough. Ironically, I'm going to use Warren Buffett here again to quote, because his, his investing style has changed over years, um, and he's very quotable. But he said, be fearful when others are greedy, and greedy when others are fearful. Greedy when others are fearful is when, when companies are ridiculously cheap, even if fundamentals are a little, little questionable. Um, that's, that's when the value investor will pounce. Now, like I said, there is, it isn't binary on one or the other. It's about emphasizing one or the other. So I, 
um, you know, like even, even, even value investors will look at fundamentals and if they're bad enough, not touch it. And, and, and depending on the value investor, it de depends where that, where that pendulum swings. Then we get something called growth investing. Now, growth investing within the valuation step, within looking at these forecasts, their emphasis will be finding companies that are growing so much, so fa faster than the market expects. So in the valuation, the emphasis is given to the growth of the company beating market expectations. Um, Philip Fisher said it well. He says, if you're in the right companies, the potential to rise is so enormous, everything else is secondary. Um, so in summary, and I'm not going to run through this again, you want to find a good business that has potential to grow into a huge business. Um, and in looking for it, you want to make sure that that good business's stock is cheap. And what is cheap? Well, there's relative, there's relative cheap, which is find a list, a good list of comparative businesses, select logical metrics from these, and ensure that the stock is attractively priced through that metrics. The apple in your hand is cheap relative to the similar apples in the bag that you've found at the marketplace. Um, or you, and or the company is cheap relative to its future in present day terms, cheap relative to free cash flows or cheap and or cheap relative to its dividends. So we want to find good businesses and make sure that we don't overpay for them. The next part coming up in December is once we found more than one good business and we're comfortable with that, those, that business's valuations and those businesses' valuations, how should we think about constructing portfolios of those businesses? Which ones do we want to hold? Which ones don't we want to hold? How do we want to think about portfolios? What stocks do you hold together? So hopefully we've got enough time for questions, but uh, that's, that's me for now. Cool. We have uh, Keith, if you've got questions, folks, drop them in the Q&A box or the chat box or wherever. First question coming through, and this is a hard one. Um, how do you value companies that don't have any revenue yet, like Renogen? Uh, so My answer is hard, <laughs> with, diffi <laughs> with difficulty. So that, that's an excellent question. And that question actually, and Renogen, is a, as an example, I can explain very simply. But there, there is in Silicon Valley, there's a concept of pre-revenue pre valuations. Yeah. And, and honestly, honestly, that is just a fantastic guesstimate. But there, there are, in fact, models where one can, uh, one can approach it. So for, say, if, say, for example, whatever the business is doing is so fantastic, you're comfortable that you're going to get a portion of an industry. So say, say for example, you're going to disrupt banking, global banking, and you're going to eat their, their, their lunch. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're so certain that this product, or whatever this business is going to do, is going to do that. Well, what you can do is you can have a look at the size of the industry. And the industry will have a annual size because all the businesses in it operate and they have a certain mm -hmm. revenue. Add all those revenues together and you get the size of the industry and say that I expect this business in 30 years time to have captured 10% of that global market and present value, present value, the value of that um, with some cost assumptions and scaling assumptions and financing assumptions and things like that. So that's a way of doing it. Um, I've done that before. And it's, it, it's, 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 it's an interesting, it, it's effectively reverse engineering what the value of a portion of an industry is because you believe this business will get it. Um, Renogen is a bit different. Renogen has an underlying resource. And in terms of that underlying resource, they are developing it, much like a man. A man has an underlying resource. So all we do is we look in talk, talking closely with management, we understand the resource better. We understand the pricing and the market for that resource. We understand the risks of development of that resource. We understand the amount of capital that will have to be either raised as equity or debt to build that, uh, to extract that resource. And then we build a 
forecast for it. We present value it. That simple. Yeah, okay. Because you know what they got in the ground and you've got a sense of what it's worth. I mean, there's risks, but there's certainly, a, a, yeah, okay. Uh, which I think is probably easier than a new tech startup, which is Ooh, promising absolutely. dog walking or, 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 or something like that. <laughs> uh, Tabang's asking, uh, how do you find a balance between a great company with a good valuation and bad management? Ooh, nice. Versus a company with poor balance sheet, but great exco uh, uh, fundamentals versus valuation. I mean, it is a tricky one. And some of them are turnarounds and those, are usually messier than they think. But what if it is a, a, a poor company, but maybe good management or the other way around? Sure. So good company with bad management or bad company with good management. I would, I would, so there's, there's lots of schools of thought, but let me give you my short answer. My short answer is that uh, you don't need to play in every game. Just because a company is listed doesn't mean you need to own it. Um, yeah, okay. yeah, both 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 of those examples will probably end in tears if left alone. And so, in both cases, you can wait for them to correct. You can wait for good management yeah. to arrive, or oh, the bad exactly. company share, to become good. Exactly. Wait for the share share of the activists to turn up and fire the board, and then jump mm -hmm. in. Or yeah. So let, let me phrase it this way: A good company with bad management um, will probably either overpaid at management will make poor capital allocation decisions that will burn them later down later in uh, in the line or um will, will will not reinvest intelligently back into their own uh, opera at the, at the core bad management will make bad capital allocation decisions and that good business will steadily erode its advantage and arrive at sometime in the future at a, <laughs> as a bad business yeah. um and a bad business with great management, let me phrase it this way. You can take the best captain in the world and put him on a ship with a hole in its hull. That ship will still sink. He can't, he can't suddenly magically sail it. <laughs> so um, that will probably end in tears as well. Now, there are always outliers and there are always ex exceptions to these uh, examples. But as a generalization, both of them will probably end in tears. You don't need to buy every listed company. Um, use your discretion. If it doesn't tick every box, maybe it's just not worth holding and move on. Yeah. And then yeah, I take a point in that. And I like the point. There's a lot of stocks. But there's 100,000. We don't need to, 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 to buy them all. Uh, question coming. What are the signs that a company of a company that's on recovery to be a good company after being hit by corporate governance scandals? I mean, we, we're talking the, the, the Steinhoffs, the EOHs, the Tongarts and the like. Yeah. And do you, and truth is others, and some of them have, have turned a lot quicker than perhaps people thought. I mean, certainly, uh, is it Adcorp, I think, was the one that very suddenly, but do you just stay away from those and say, I'm going to wait for the evidence rather than wait for this, you know, sort of pounce on the signs? So, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of money to be made where a good business that has been badly run gets rid of management and brings in good management who it would take a time to put band-aids on and fix things and stuff, but they can, it can generate a huge amount of upside because you're taking two things and putting them together, a good core business mm -hmm. that probably ends up with good management and probably what you're doing is fixing the balance sheet because this is typically where the signs of bad management start to appear as bad is, is in the balance sheet debt starts to ratchet up and things, yeah things i mean like omni that. is a case in point locally absolutely but let, let me phrase it this way when considering whether a a company that is attempting a turnaround and and for example has had a corporate governance scandal has it can turn around consider two key things the first one is obvious ignoring the balance sheet is this a good business mm -hmm. does it does it generate does it have pricing power all these things that i've touched on does it have that the only difference is it's been badly run so so it's got pricing power it's got barriers to entry it's good quality in every sense of the word ignoring how it was run um because that gives you a good base to work with. And then the second one, and the second one is, 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 is quite intuitive. You, the people that messed it up need to leave. Mm -hmm. If the same people that made, the, that, that, that made all the bad decisions 
are still around, explain to me what has actually changed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. And part of this, Keith, would also be what we're going to talk about, what you're going to talk about in the next, uh, in the December presentation, which is about building that portfolio. You'll have, and it comes to conviction, and you might have a, a turnaround, and there's a good business, and there's a, a, a new team, in, and it looks like a good team, but you don't have 100% conviction. So perhaps it's a smaller position, and it can then grow into a larger position. Um, absolutely. I mean, so... So in terms of picking fundamentals and valuing companies, this is about understanding business and valuations, but in yeah. terms of running portfolios, it's about managing risk. Um, and that's, that is yeah. quite an esoteric uh, concept, but a very important one. But I think we preempting. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that on, 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 on 9th of December. Uh, another question, and last one so far. So folks, if you've got more, drop them in. Otherwise, uh, we'll take this one. What about a company such as Clicks, which has always been expensive, and you can make a good argument that it's a good company and had good management, but its valuations were always stretched? Yeah, so clicks is an interesting one. Um, it, it, clicks is, depending on which metric you look at, the highest quality listed um, retail pharmacy in the world. Yeah. And, you, and, and there are a number of ones listed, but you can look on gross profit margin, return on capital. Um, let me phrase it this way. Clicks generates a higher return on equity than Discam over, over most years. And it's ungeared, whereas mm -hmm. Discam is, <laughs> is very geared. So, so it's not even the business model that's made it so good. It's been well, well run. It's been in the right space with a good business model and well run. So, yeah, this is, this is a hard trade-off between style. What I will say is the value investors have been avoiding clicks for the last decade and have, uh, have regretted doing so. Some quality investors sacrificed valuation to buy it, and uh, they've done very well. And the growth, growth investors have bought it 10 years ago and have been loving it all the way. So it all depends. And this is where what makes sense to you starts to become more important. Um, Clicks is a really good business. Ticks every single quality metric you can look for. Does it tick your valuation metric? Or are you willing to budge on that? That's a personal yeah. question. Actually, that's a good point. Also, what I like, and let's stay with clicks for a moment, is, is work out what you think is a, a, a fair price for it, and, and then and then you wait. And and you know, I, I yeah, I, I've done it with a few stocks, and 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 it, it in some cases it's worked, and in others it hasn't. Um, but you know, you you simply wait, and 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 you know, you you can wait for years. I didn't buy any shoprite shares for years and years and years because I loved the business, I loved the management team, I didn't like the price. Um, I wasn't paying two hundred and forty bucks for shoprite. Didn't matter how good it was. Um, and then boom, last year there it was, hundred bucks. Um, uh, I, so you're gonna say? I was just gonna say this. This is the value of doing the work. Is just because you've done the work and decided not to buy the stock doesn't mean that work was, was worthless. First of all, not investing in a business is an active decision as well. It could, its share price could collapse, the business could collapse, and you've avoided a loss by doing the work. So it's sometimes not always the money you make, it's the, it's the losses you've avoided that are yeah. also very, very important. And then second of all, if you've done the work and you know what you think it should be worth, keep following the business. Yeah. Have in your mind, know what you're willing to pay for it. And who knows, like in March last year, the world went on sale and there were so many things to buy, but you only had about a month. Little did we know you only had a month to buy everything. I thought I had years. Was... I thought I had years. <laughs> me, me, we all did. We all did. We all played March wrong. I should have, I should have second mortgaged my house and thrown yeah. all of that into the market. But the point being is that you didn't have time to do the work. You just had to make the, make the call. And the only way you're armed to do that is by having done the work already. Yeah. Um, and that's it. And, and you update it every six months with new results. And it was your earlier point as well, that time value of money. Sure. Let's say you paid 200 bucks for shop, right? You know, it's back there. You've earned dividends. And in 20 years time, 200 bucks is going to be a cheap price. But while it was going nowhere or down and every, you know, for five years, you've basically been in a sideways share. You were better off doing something else with that cash and, and waiting the price. Another question coming through, what happens around when acquisitions start to happen? And I've got a new policy, man. When a company goes and does a big acquisition, I take my money and run because they just don't work. 
and I know I'm being jaundiced here. Yes, I'm looking at you, Woolies. Um, but I mean, they fundamentally change the picture. And we, if we stay with Woolies as a moment, we knew what they were. They were a brilliant food division, a so-so clothing division. And they went to Australia and, and just became for a while there a, a, a dad. So let me, let me phrase what you just said, uh, Simon, slightly differently. Mm -hmm. it, it, what, what, what Simon is explaining to you guys is in his process um, where he's looking at quality, one of the boxes in fundamentals that is a huge cross is a management team risking their balance sheets. Remember I said cost structure, mm, debt, mm, and mm. a large acquisition typically will bring a huge amount of debt onto the balance sheet. Risking their balance sheet, which detracts from everything else they have if you just have too much debt. And then, so it's major risk. And therefore, irrespective of evaluation and irrespective of growth, if the, these fundamentals deteriorate because of that, it's not worth holding. So acquisitions are a tricky one. Um, but analyze them how you would analyze everything else. Um, yeah, does, I like yeah, that point. Does, and in the case of David Jones and Woolies, David Jones was listed. So what I and others could have gone and done was take the David Jones results, pump them into Woolies, add their debt on the, on the liability side of the, of the balance sheet and say, well, now what does this company look like? And the answer was terrible, but but we actually had the data in an unlisted acquisition, different game, but in an enlisted one, it's just some 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 effort. Absolutely. I mean, think of, think about it this way: ignoring the operational benefits, because some acquisitions make large operational benefits. Sure, sure. And and ensuring that the company is not taking on too much risk, i.e., debt for mm. the acquisition, and hopefully not overpaying for the acquisition. Consider. And all of those things aside, consider that the company itself is an investor. What are they buying? Does it pass yeah. your fundamentals test? If yeah. you valued it, would you pay that price for it? And if if it doesn't, and it's too no, if it's very very small, it's it's a it's sure. a small cross against the company. But if it's large, and the fundamentals don't make sense, and the valuation they paid for it doesn't make sense, well then you've you, you've effectively detracted from, from the business. I mean, like that, that management team buying this, making this acquisition are themselves being an investor. Yes, so that's actually you, a great point. So, so would you back that decision? And if not, well, then don't back that investor. Yeah. So what I should have done was when they said they're buying David Jones, is I should have gone and valued David Jones and said, the price that they're paying, is that a price that I would pay? And I get the point around synergies, although with David Jones, uh, and, and I, I, I'm... I'm, I'm quite skeptical of, of, of synergies. I appreciate they're there oftentimes, but it seems more often not. But go value the David Jones acquisition, look at that, and it comes out at, I don't know, five Oz dollars, and they're paying eight, and you're like, yo, I wouldn't pay eight. Like, you guys help yourself. And, and the point is, just to the, to, to the folks in the webcast, in hindsight, and I have deconstructed the, the Woolies very, very much from, from my portfolio perspective, because Woolies was for a while one of my preferred and largest holdings. Um, and, and it's not a case of as soon as they announce I sell, but I like the idea of because they're buying a listed, I can go value that. And I don't sell immediately because markets like the idea of M&A and they will run the share. Uh, so I might get out at a higher price, but the the short answer is is that you know in, in hindsight they just paid far too much for a B grade asset. Yeah, so I mean, what what I'll add to that is my personal experience uh, with this is I've got two tick boxes that I look for, hmm. assuming by the way that it's in a company where I trust management and good fundamentals and everything, um, and if it is, I'll make sure that that the acquisition they're making is not too large. What I classify as too large is more than 20% of the group. Yeah, I was going to so say if, 20. Yeah, if, if, yeah. They, if, they, if they're doing, if they're writing a check for more than 20% of the group, I start to get very worried. The second thing is I make sure they're not overpaying. So I will scrutinize the valuation and consider it. Because if they're underpaying and the synergies don't turn up, well, that's all right. You know, you, mm. 
you're still getting capital appreciation sure. on, 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 on this investment. And you know what? If you've got a margin of safety in that purchase price, it's not too large on the balance sheet. So you could take time to extract the synergies. Um, and, and I will leave it up to management to and, and trust them, assuming I do, but I'm, I only invest in businesses where I trust management. But if you trust management, trust them that the acquisition makes sense with, and they can integrate within the group. But size and yeah. valuation are key and, risk considerations. And, and size goes to your earlier point that if it is a big, if it's a big deal, even if it's a good one, the size of the deal can 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 damage the balance sheet. And and I come back to ARB, which I know is a stock that you and I have followed for yo 15 years maybe. And they sat on a couple of hundred million, what, 350 million Rand when their market cap was only about 600. And they did nothing with that money. They wouldn't give it back to no. the shareholders. And, and they've slowly spent it down. Although truthfully, because they're cash generative, they spend it and then they get more cash. They've also done a lot of very clever and frankly, fairly small deals. Yeah. So, so another way to think about it is that balance sheets can start to become competitive advantages. Yeah. Um, a, a good example of that is Rybex in the in the domestic listed mm -hmm. uh, construction sector. So Rybex has a soft, unspoken policy of keeping a billion rand on their balance sheet, mm -hmm. liquid with firepower. Because one, they can make they can very quickly write a check and make an acquisition if it makes sense, or there's a distressed asset, or they can take on a large project and they and they don't need to do, seek out funding. So so that you. It just a bulletproof balance sheet can be a very big competitive advantage as opposed a competitor that perhaps on the ground operationally is just as good as you, but it, but in fact, the balance sheet behind them is highly indebted. Um, yeah. Whereas and you're, it, uh, yeah. And the same for when COVID happens and you mentioned the property stocks and you know, a lot of them were, were taking their loan to values and flying them close to the wind. You know, they were Oof, within very covenants. Close. You know, the covenant would say, I don't know, 45%. And they're, oh, we're at 44 and a half. Everything's good. Yeah, everything's good until it rains outside, never mind a global pandemic, in which case mm. now everything's bad. And it, it comes back to, and it, 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 I mean, it was one of the first things I learned when I was learning about markets and all of this sort of thing was balance sheets. And truthfully, I learned it because it was an easy part of, of, of learning, but it's the importance. And the one reason I never bought Steinhoff wasn't because I'm the smartest oak in the room. It's just, I couldn't unpack their balance sheet. I just, you know, to me, that's the simplest part of the, the, an organization is a balance sheet. It's a snapshot in time. You know, it's one, two different sides, they add up and I couldn't reconcile their balance sheet uh, and their debt structure. And it's like, well, if I don't understand it, I can't own it. Yeah. So, so perhaps a way to think about it and it's an oversimplification, but if you, if you want to look at the upside in a company, look at the income statement and the cash flow statement. Mm. If you want to look at the downside, mm -hmm. look at the balance sheet. Um, I like that. The yeah. debt, like the, the, the balance sheet will highlight if, if the company is in fact in fragile health, yeah. whereas the income statement may not. There might be a lot of things hiding, hiding there. Um, so so cons consider that. Yeah, folks, we will park that there. We have hit our time and we have run out of questions. And truthfully, Keith and I could chat until the, I mean, the cows went out again. Um, but we'll leave it there. Keith, really appreciate the time this evening. Uh, the next one is 9th of December. If you're here this evening, you've actually booked for the entire series. So you will get the email to remind you. Uh, if you can't make it, there will be a video. And then we're back in January. And I have, I think it's the 12th of Jan. I can't remember. But again, you've booked for that as well. And that will be the final one in, in, in the series. Uh, to ladies and gents, really appreciate your time this evening. Uh, Keith, really, huge thanks. That was a great Fun. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone who attended. Cheers all.